So good afternoon and welcome. It's good to see you here with us this afternoon. I'm Roger Mark de Souza. I direct our environmental change and security program here at the Wilson Center. And welcome to the Wilson Center. As many of you know, we are a living memorial to President Wilson and to his legacy. And in his legacy, we bring together analysis, policy, and practice. And our program, the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center, looks at various connections between health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security, and we are supported um, with our long-term partners, USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. And this week, I feel that we have a triple whammy at the center, and I'm going to start, I'm going to do this a little backwards. On first, on Friday, this Friday, at, one th at um, 11.30, we have a session with our longtime friends from IUCN on raising the bar for Red Plus, strengthening the role of women and gender equality on climate um, so that's going to be a really good session. Tomorrow at 1 o'clock, we are working with our partners at CNA Corporation on the release of a new report on national security and the accelerating risks of climate change. So keeping in the theme of climate change, today, now, we're going to be discussing how we can strengthen the feel of climate change and climate change adaptation by examining the role of demography in responding to climate change. I also think we have a triple whammy in the room because we have two great, excellent speakers and we have you. So this is going to be really good. I think we'll have a lot of time for discussion, and we're really looking for some active uh, participation from you uh, today. So I'd like to start by um, our, recognizing our first speaker, Susanna Adamo. She's an associate research scientist at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network at Columbia University, and she's a coordinator of the population, a co-coordinator of the Population and Environmental Research Network. Pern, which I know many of us are, are very familiar with. And in preparation for today's event, I was uh, talking to Susanna a little bit about her background and, and her comments for today. And Susanna said to me, you know, Roger Mark, I'm a hardcore demographer. And, you know, I got to talk about methods. I got to give some of the evidence behind these issues and how it relates to current issues today, like climate change. But she said, I also want to avoid what she calls a charla de café, café conversations, which are just, you know, looking at what's popular out there and talking about it because there's a buzz, but without a scientific underpin uh, underpinning and base. But as we talked more about demography and population characteristics and population studies, and Susanna and I were talking about theory and methods and processes and what does this mean for policymakers, she just just looked at me at one point and said, you know what? I just like it. I like talking about this stuff because it's so important. So I'm sure um, as we get to Susanna's comments, you'll see this passion and commitment uh, for the issues and for evidence. So on that note, Susanna, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here, and I hope I <laughs> live up to the expectation that Marsh has raised. Yes, I am a demographer. Well, I also just speak up a little bit. Uh, here? Oh, okay. So uh, I am a demographer. I mean that I approach these issues of uh, population and climate change from a certain point of view where we examine not only the theory but also the evidence and also how exactly to communicate those, all those numbers in something that could be uh, actually uh, useful and, and relevant, not only for the demography community, but also for the rest of the communities. And I want to start the talk today with something that seems and is very simple, that is the population distribution. Uh, that is there? Okay. How? Okay. This is the forward? Okay. With this map, this is a, a map that we at CSN we are preparing now that is showing the population distribution in a grid. It means that every point that you see there is a cell, one kilometer by one kilometer, and it's just putting the 
population table from censuses in a map, and it's showing the population distribution around 2010. And the first thing that you can see, of course, is that the population distribution is extremely uneven on the surface of the Earth. And that, in my opinion, has a direct influence in the exposure, not as much as vulnerability so far, but exposure to everything that has to do with environment, and particularly to climate change and uh, the impacts of climate change. One of the things that is very obvious is the concentration of population in Asia and in some of the countries in Africa. Uh, particularly in India and in China, but because of the resolution of the map, it's not so easy to see the other kind of concentration that is the concentration in a specific areas that are the cities. And that's another important characteristic of the distribution of the population currently, that is the growing urbanization trends, the fact that around 2008, according to the UN, we crossed the divide, uh, started to be a more urban society, globally because more than 50% of the population of the world was living in an area denominated as urban. That changed from country to country, but there is certain densities issues that are common. Um, the developing countries are urbanizing at a very, very fast pace. And there is a lot of unevenness on that too, but you can see that some of the red dots that represent cities of 10 million or more are located in the developing world, mostly in Asia. Asia is a country, the continent that is urbanizing at a very high spice, but Africa is close to, to that. The distribution of population in any given moment of time is going to be the, the result of underlying processes. So it has to do with how habitable the area is in terms of resources and in terms of climate or in terms of topology or topography, if you want. It also has a history of settlement behind that. So there is an historical trend that also is influencing where people are in this particular moment. And very important at the local level is that Population distribution is the outcome of the interplay of the three demographic processes of fertility, mortality, and migration. So um, this particular map, what is showing is the changes in population density between 1990 and 2005. Everything that is green is declining density. Everything that is orange is increasing density. And it, these increases and decreases are happening all over the world, not only in developing areas, it's also in, in, in uh, developed areas. So this is something that they happen all over the world. And the three processes that we just mentioned are behind this. Particularly migration is the one that is the quickest response to any change in underlying condition and is going to result in a very quick difference in population density in a short, relatively short term that could be 10 years or 15, 15 years. However, uh, particularly in terms of the urbanization, the first uh, urbanization wave has to do with the um, movement of people from the rural areas to the urban areas. But even migration, as in an area or a country or a continent advance in the urban transition, migration starts to be less important, particularly migration from rural to urban areas. The migration between urban areas start to be more and more important. And at a certain level, like when an area is 80% or 90% urban, the natural increase of the urban areas started are more important than the migration flows that were the origin of that particular urbanization trend. So the different processes at different point in the transition or the development included uh, have different meanings, and all of them are important. See how it goes continue here. Um, sorry. But migration has also a very important um, relevance in terms of concentration, concentrating people in the short time. This particular map is an, in, as an kind of, uh, how do you call this? An experiment that we did uh, to see if it was possible to map at the global level net migration. Net migration is only the difference between in migration and out migration in a certain area. The blue areas are areas that are losing population according to our, because of migration because you can also lose population because of mortality. But in this case, because of migration, the red areas is the areas where population increase because of migration. 
Um, so as the uh, population transition and the urban transition advance, people start moving around. And when they are doing this, they start moving also be between and within different ecosystems. So certain ecosystems in this case you can see in the uh, west of Africa and particularly in the case of uh, Mexico, the dry ecosystem usually are losing population and the coastal ecosystem where most of the urban areas are, are increasingly having more and more immigration. This is showing the net migration between 1990 and 2000 uh, only. Because this capacity of migration of moving uh, people around and moving people between ecosystems that could be more proclaimed to impact or ecosystems that could be more fragile than others to the impact of climate change, is that we can say that migration has a role in changing the vulnerability of places. So this is what happened in the geography of vulnerability is changing because of the effect of in highly uh, the high uh, migration, the high mobility of the population that is happening now. That is one of the global processes recognized as contributing to globalization. Now, um, excuse me. Um, is already know there's a fair amount of uh, project and studies that are looking at climate migration as a response to environmental impact, particularly the impact of climate uh, change. Now, the problem is how to determine the relevance or the exact weight of the environmental factors when you are looking at environmental migration and particularly to the impact of climate change. There's numbers outside. None of those numbers has any kind of agreement at all. And there's more and more discussion about how exactly to improve the methodologies and the data that you are using in order to have some kind of scenarios or um, um, projection about what the future climate migration could look at. And the effect of climate change could be direct or could be indirect. Uh, so it could be the effect directly on livelihoods or it could be through some other uh, can, some kind of social network could be an impact on the community that lately translate to impact into the different household and individual. So the impacts of climate change are complex uh, and could be, as I mentioned, direct and indirect. There is another type of um, mobility that is displacement that is more related to disasters and it's something that um, is happening now and every time that there is a disaster, it could be climate disaster or any, kind, any other kind of disaster. Displacement tend to be temporary and people return to the places, at least there is some catastrophic changes. But studies on Katrina have showed that that return is always selective as migration is selective. So return of displacement also is something that is uh, being, st being studied with more uh, detail. The, this effect of climate change on mobility also has a differential effect on cities, and but two different reasons. In the current migration system, the cities are the areas of destination. Most of these urban areas are areas that are increasing, as we saw in the map, the population because of immigration. If this is the case, any effect outside the cities that is affecting the areas of origin is going to increase the flow of people into the cities. At the same time, we also see so that a lot of the cities are on the coast. And coast could be affected not only for sea level rise, that is a low, very slow onset uh, event, but also for storm surge coming from increasing frequency of hurricanes or increasing, or increasing uh, number of uh, storms. And in that case, being this, the, the site of uh, migration, that could be secondary migration, or also the fact that my cities could start being areas of out migration because of the effect of climate change. It doesn't, I mean, migration could be defined in, in many ways. It doesn't need to be a very long movement is just that people that is in areas that are exposed during the city are moving outside the city or other areas uh, within the same city. Um, I just talk about selectivity. Migration, as I mentioned, is a very selective process affecting mostly young men and women. 
higher, more educated relative to other other parts and better off, relatively speaking, in terms of the rest of the population in the area where they are uh, living. That means that when people move, they are taking their characteristics with them and they are changing the characteristics of areas of origin and the areas of destination. One has to do with the selectivity of the flows, the other has to do with where migrants set within the urban areas. And in some cases, that could increase spatial segregation that some studies are related more and more to enhance, enhance uh, vulnerability when disasters occur, particularly recent migrants that are more likely to have less connections. But these flows are also changing the characteristics of the areas of origin in terms of the structure of opportunities that are available there and in also in terms of the composition of the population that is left behind or decided just to stay. Um, the good news for, at least for our community, is that more and more studies are, are dealing with migration and climate change. This is showing just the number of articles on migration and climate change in the web of knowledge that are mostly uh, peer review journal. And you look at 19, 2003, yeah. That's when I finished my dissertation that was exactly on <laughs> migration and environment. And in 2012, we are orders of magnitude, even if this is small, comparing with other, in terms of publication and in terms of research, and specifically about the uh, data availability that means that there's more input for policy. We still need to be more proactive in how to, to make that usable for the rest of the communities. And with that, I just want to mention some of the research gaps that I consider that are important. There is a lot of discussion in terms of methodology and new conceptual uh, framework, especially the recognizing how complex this situation is and how this has to be uh, an interdisciplinary issue that cannot be led only to demographers to deal with. But at the same time, what is happening, because they are more interested in the topic, that the data issues started to be very, very important. Migration already have this kind of cloud that being a very difficult issue because the data is not available, simply not there. These two quotes from the Geo5 uh, as one of the very, very weak link in terms of data availability. There are more sources of data, but there's still a lot to do in order to make them comparable and specifically to make them integrated with the other kind of data that you need in order to model climate migration as response to impact of climate change. The other is your reference data. Everything that has to do with environment, in my opinion, has to be uh, a study using some kind of georeference data. You have to go to space and start putting things together over there, particularly for exposure. There is a lot, a lot of advances on this, but there's still more than has to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. I really like that as you, you approach a topic, you put it in the broader demographic lens, just reminding us of uh, fertility, mortality, and migration, how they all fit together. And from there, I was, I was glad to hear you talk about ecosystems and migration to different ecosystems. Um, we don't always hear demographers looking at migration studies from that perspective. So I was glad to hear you talk about moving between ecosystems, dry and coastal ecosystems. And then um, you raised this sort of key point that we very often talk about in research on climate change and the question of vulnerability. So I was very glad to see you make that link and to, to make the point that migration has a role in shaping vulnerability. And um, you talked about what that means in terms of being able to make the link and the, um, the degree to which this is a response to environmental hazards and how that is emerging as a field, direct and indirect impacts, and then recognizing that there are different types of migration patterns. You talked about um, circular migration, you talk about displacement when um, a disaster occurs, and then return migration. So very important components and the complexity and richness of migration studies. And then looking at the differential impact on cities, you know, there's a lot of work, recently work has been done by UNFPA looking at urbanization as an adaptation strategy. So a lot of work being done in that 
that area. And then looking at what it means for the selectivity of the flows, so actually looking at the composition, who is migrating, what that means, but where are they migrating to, what are the characteristics of these locations, what's happening to the sending areas, so what does it mean for the composition of the, of the, the areas that people are leaving, and how is it affecting the receiving areas, where people are going to. And really appreciate sort of ending on the research note, where we, in terms of a field, how is this being examined, there's more peer-reviewed research coming out in this area, and where can we move forward, where do we recognize the gaps. And um, so you packed a lot in there. Your passion came through. So thanks very much, Susanna. That was an excellent, excellent presentation. So I'd like to introduce you to our second speaker, Marcel Leroy. And Marcel and I met a few months ago in Ethiopia. We were doing some work on climate and, and security. So Marcel is a senior researcher at the University for Peace in the Africa program. He's based um, in Ethiopia. And as Marcel and I were talking about these, this session today, Marcel said, you know, I want to tell you what my life's mission is. And according to Marcel, his life's mission is that you don't believe anything if you can avoid it. So I thought that was quite intriguing, and I'm looking forward to see how uh, Marcel brings his life's mission to his presentation today and the, the complex issues around com, um, climate and migration. So Marcel? Thank you, Roger Mark. I'm, I'm happy to be back in Washington after many years, in fact, I completed my PhD at Johns Hopkins almost to the day 40 years ago. Uh, so it's been a long time, although I've been back in the meantime. And um, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I, was, I was living in Baltimore, I must say, which I really enjoyed as a living environment. Um, uh, during that 40 year period, I've had two careers one as an academic and another one as a diplomat and international public servant. And as Roger Mark said, basically my advice to students and colleagues in both of my professions has always been, don't believe anything if you can avoid it. In other words, be critical. Don't take things uh, at face value because usually that is the wrong way to go. Uh, just look at what people's motivation and uh, uh, underlying philosophy is before you uh, make a judgment on uh, how credible they are. I've been based in Africa for nearly 20 years now, first on behalf of the European Union, and then uh, after I quote unquote retired from the European Union, I joined the University for Peace and remained in Addis Ababa. So my perspective, having been based in Sudan, Ethiopia, Djibouti, and for a while in Nigeria during that period, my perspective, of course, is largely African. And uh, I'm happy that Susanna gave you the global picture so I can be a little bit more parochial. Uh, Climate change and climate variability, of course, are not new. And if you look at what's happened in Africa, um, uh, during the last ice age, um, there was a lot more rain. And in fact, this is not unlike some of the uh, weather phenomena that you are observing now, where there are many more uh, episodes of torrential rains than used to be the case, and, and this can be partly explained because of uh, rising temperatures and rising humidity levels in the air. Imagine what it must have been like during the last ice age or at the end of the last ice age when the temperatures between air and water were much, the differences in temperature were much greater, leading to more evaporation and torrential downpours. Um, and of course, this also meant that Africa was more humid, but also other parts, uh, you know, um, if you want to uh, hear about Noah's flood, um, National Geographic, not so far from here, has made a wonderful documentary uh, about Noah's flood, how uh, rising levels in the Mediterranean, because of course, 
the amount of water on Earth is fixed, whether it is fluid or frozen or in vapor form. Uh, you know, it's it's essentially uh, fixed. So the release of lots of uh, fluid water from uh, the melting of the ice uh, allowed ocean levels to rise. And uh, in uh, the Black Sea was dry at that point. It was just a depression. So what happened, the Bosphorus broke and became a waterfall that went on for decades. And uh, so, well, you can imagine, I'm not going to go into any uh, alternative explanation, but G National Geographic, uh, located a few blocks from here, I think, shed uh, ample light on what happened. And of course, it was a result of climate change. Um, so uh, then was the drying of the Sahara. Uh, if you uh, look at, at uh, rock paintings and, and rock sculptures in Chad and so on, you see uh, uh, crocodiles and giraffes and you know animals that we associate with equatorial Africa rather than with the Sahel. But uh, there was then a long period of trying, and just uh, you know, I, I don't want to take you through ancient African history, but just to show the potential uh, that these migratory flows can have. People who lived in the Sahara, or what we now consider the Sahara, uh, could not stay there because they could not sustain their livelihood, which was hunting and gathering. And a lot of them moved to the Nile Valley. And I think there's a very nice theory, again, a theory, but a, a very nice one on the origin of Egyptian civilization, because you had a cross-fertilization of people who had very different perspectives uh, about livelihoods and, and how to sustain themselves. And this led to, to, I think, this led to a flourishing of civilization in the Nile Valley and the, the height of Egyptian civilization many centuries afterwards. Um, Global warming, of course, affects Africa, but with regional variations. And um, I found this map, which I must give credit to uh, uh, Professor David Lopez Carr of the University <coughs> of California in Santa Barbara, uh, who included this in an article of which he was the lead author. But what I, I want to, uh, and uh, you know, I go back to don't believe anything if you can avoid it. The the uh, assumption seems to be that there is drying throughout the African continent or that there is less rainfall. Well, sorry, not true. Uh, the blue areas uh, denote areas that have received increased rain precipitation over the last 30 years. The red decreased. Of course, uh, you know, and, and this means, for instance, the graining of the Sahel uh, which is uh, visible from satellite images, uh, is a result of increases in precipitation from about 1990 onwards. This doesn't necessarily mean that the Sahel has become more hospitable in terms of sustaining life or animals because uh, since there had been overgrazing and uh, there was very little seed reserve in the ground, a lot of the greening actually turns out to be invasive species which are not suitable as fodder crops. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, the, the, the amount of rainfall, uh, I think, has not uniformly declined. Uh, now, if you compare this to population change, Sorry, unfortunately, Sorry, okay, so okay. Oh, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look at my uh, little monitor here. If you compare this to, to population change, uh, of course, some of the areas that have had decreases in precipitation are areas that have had the highest population increase. And of course, this is uh, a problematic issue, and I'm talking here, for instance, about large parts of Ethiopia and Kenya, uh, you know, some of the, the most densely populated countries in Africa. Uh, so uh, we often observe uh, scarcity in these regions. 
and the scarcity results from the effects of climate change combined with the effects of population increase. Because even if the climate wasn't changing, but the population rises at 3% a year, as it does in many of these countries, the per capita of availability of resources is going to decline. And so very often when you talk of problems that are induced by climate change, even in, in you know, articles done by uh, scholars who, who do or should know better, uh, there is no attempt to disaggregate the effect of climate change and, and uh, uh, population increase. Um, I think luckily, and then of course we base assumptions on how to adapt to climate change uh, uh, on what we observe about climate change or what we think we observe, which isn't always um, uh, that well founded. Uh, the good thing uh, of, about adaptation is, of course, that in the end we will have to move towards sustainable development anyway, and whether we do this motivated by population increase or motivated by what we think is climate change doesn't make much difference as long as we do it. Uh, so the, the uh, effect is not uh, so terrible. Now, I, I just want to move to one last map here, which is a map of the US which was published in the New York Times just last week, uh, you know, as part of an article on uh, the current climate change in, in the United States. And I, I simply want to draw your attention to the fact that the prevalence of red, that is regions with declining precipitation, is substantially higher in the US than it was in Africa. So, you know, the, the, the overall assumption uh, often formulated that, you know, Africa contributed least to global warming but is suffering the most, you know, I'm not uh, denying the idea that Africa is suffering, but I think that uh, uh, the rest of the world is going to suffer at least as much. In fact, I was thinking of using some photographs uh, because I'm a, 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 an, an avid photographer and I make a couple of thousand pictures a year. Um, uh, but the most depressing pictures about trout that I could find when I look back over what I had done, uh, the pictures I took over the last few months, were pictures taken in January of this year while I was traveling through California, not Africa. Um, anyway. Susanna spoke about migration, and of course, in, in Africa, I think inevitably, uh, there are uh, high flows of migration, and they will continue. Um, population growth, and you know, I'm based in the Horn of Africa, uh, is, uh, oops, okay. Uh, population growth uh, in, in most of these countries is still 3% a year, and even though uh, there are declines in fertility, that is family size decreasing from 8, 30 or 40 years ago to 4 at this stage and perhaps going down to 3 in another 10 years. Um, uh, this will not really have a major impact on the rate of population growth for the simple reason that there's a flywheel effect. Uh, you will in uh, 20 or 30 years have more young adults than you have now because these children have already been born and as they form families, even if those families are smaller, uh, the birth rate on a population basis will essentially remain unchanged. So you're talking about Ethiopia doubling uh, its population in, in 25, in the best of times, 30 years, and it's 90 million now. Uh, so you're looking at, uh, you know, 200 million, I would say, by 2050, almost unavoidable, even if fertility continues to decline. So you will have migration. Uh, a lot of the migration will be internal, quite simply because the land, uh, most, uh, 
the, the uh, Horn of Africa still has a very uh, low rate of urbanization. Most people are subsistence farmers, and if a farmer has eight children, he cannot keep subdividing his land. Everybody will end up having, you know, half an acre and, and a goat and, and a donkey if things are going well. So people will have to move to cities and there will be no possibility for return, basically, because there's nothing to go back to. Uh, they cannot have a livelihood uh, in, in the areas where they came from. So you will necessarily have high migration fl flows uh, and, and of course the drivers of, of migration are uh, lack of, of uh, employment, uh, livelihood issues. Most of the migration will be domestic as it is now uh, moving into cities. In Ethiopia so far a lot of the migration has been from one rural area to another but that is also likely to come to an end because of population increase and because of differences in uh, land use pattern. So, um, uh, what does climate change do with respect to migration? Um, in fact, I think that uh, climate change may uh, accelerate migration, but uh, to the extent that I've seen attempts at modeling, and I can give some references to, to those who, who would like, uh, a young fellow called Justin Ginetti has done a master's thesis at Tufts a couple of years ago. Uh, all models are crude and all models are wrong, but I think his is probably less wrong than, than most. But basically, he, can, he concludes that climate change adds very little uh, to the expected migration flows because population increase, land degradation, uh, et cetera, these are the main drivers and population uh, and uh, climate change will add to that, but um, a relatively minor, uh, to a relatively minor extent only. Uh, so some of this migration ends up being international and you know, since I've worked with the European Union for many years, and we may still talk about that afterwards, but this is, of course, a major concern in Europe that, you know, all these people from sub-Saharan Africa will end up uh, trying to cross the Mediterranean one way or another, as is already the case. Um, nevertheless, I mean, the, the, the flows of migration toward Europe in relative terms are relatively low. Um, there's a lot more migration traditionally to the Middle East, although some of these channels are now also being closed by Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states becoming more restrictive, and the countries of origin, in particular Ethiopia, refusing to allow people to be recruited because of all the problems that have been reported in the press, uh, abuse, and et cetera. Um, uh, but that will not necessarily slow the rate of migration. People will simply look for other areas to go to. And there's evidence that Southern Africa, South Africa in particular, uh, is becoming uh, an uh, increasing choice uh, for those wishing to, to migrate. Uh, illegal migration to the Middle East has picked up again in the last couple of months after having reached the low uh, during the winter. Uh, November, December, January, but the, the, the rates uh, going, and most of these are simply crossing from uh, the Horn of Africa, Djibouti, uh, Somaliland, Puntland, to Yemen. Uh, and of course, you know that the Saudis uh, also are trying to build a fence uh, between themselves, and, and uh, I'm sure some people have flyers and uh, manage to uh, not to be deterred by that. Uh, it's very difficult to stop migration flows. Uh, the only suggestion that I would have is that intra-regional migration might provide an outlet for some of the people wanting to go. And of course, this would mean that the regional economic community, which covers Eastern Africa, and I think the same would apply to the other areas, uh, other parts of Africa, um, would need to expand. Uh, that is, uh, would need to provide economic opportunities so that people would go, say, from Ethiopia to Kenya uh, in order to join 
uh, a boom there rather than trying to move to the Middle East or uh, Europe. And I think this, uh, you know, the policy avenue here is to encourage regional integration in Africa because, as you know, the, the trade among African countries is very low, much lower than their trade bilaterally, either with the European Union or with the US. And, and uh, you know, they need increased sizes of markets. And I think the EU has been a good example that this does work. Um, and um, that would be one avenue to pursue. Last point is impact on security. And this is probably the one that I have written most about. So I'm going to try and be very brief. There's been, a few years ago, an avalanche of publications on uh, climate change and conflict, many of them making very dire warnings about, you know, what's going to happen, uh, uh, you know, people. And all of these are based on the assumptions that uh, climate change will increase uh, scarcity and scarcity will lead to conflict. Frankly, I don't think that the evidence bears this out. Scarcity can be uh, a reason for cooperation, and there are increasingly studies being done, for example, in pastoralist areas in the Horn of Africa that indicate that during periods of drought, people actually do cooperate more. They find ways of using the, the few resources that are left in a more efficient manner. Uh, and I would say uh, water use, for example, uh, is an indication. I think there are more treaties on sharing water resources than there are on any other topic. So, uh, you know, we shouldn't necessarily assume that climate change is going to increase the incidence of conflict. Uh, in fact, uh, there may be a link, but if there is, it's not quite as direct. Again, using an example from the Horn of Africa, among pastoralists, uh, the uh, incidence of conflict tends to go up after the weather improves, that is, after periods of drought, when the rains resume, then there is more uh, conflict. And, you know, you can give various explanations for this. It's easier to steal cattle because they can hide in the grass, uh, or, you know, you don't need to take them to watering points as often because they, they don't need as much moisture. Uh, and then, of course, from the point of view of the, the the, the person who, who's motivated to go out and raid uh, uh, other people's cattle, uh, they may have lost most or all of their cattle during long periods of drought, and uh, they're eager to take advantage of the better conditions to restock their herd. Um, you know, so it, that, of course, means that there is a link between climate change and conflict, but it's not as simple. Uh, as uh, you may or has been uh, claimed uh, in, in, in many writings. The incidence of governance is crucial. And, you know, I've, my last position for the European Union was as uh, uh, political advisor to the EU Special Representative for Sudan, who, who was a Finn and who rarely came in the, the spot. So I, I, I uh, dealt primarily with the uh, conflict in Darfur and, and also represented the EU at the uh, peace talks on Darfur in Abuja. Um, and uh, really, having looked at various sides, we also, University for Peace in, in Addis Ababa has links with the three universities in Darfur that continued operating throughout the conflict. Um, and our conclusion really has been that governance is the key issue in the Darfur conflict. It's not a climate war. It's not an environmental war. It's a war that was caused by uh, uh, elites making decisions about resources and neglecting certain other areas. Uh, this has been the main driver. And of course, the fact also that over uh, something like uh, a 20 year period, the population doubled and the livestock population quadrupled that's roughly between 1980 and 2000. And this simply became untenable. So, you know, I think we, we need to be very careful about linking uh, climate change to security questions. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you.
Thank you, Marcel. I thought it was a very uh, provocative uh, presentation, and I think you really did accomplish your goal of challenging our assumptions on various levels, whether it's a question of looking at what's the relationship between population dynamics and, and precipitation, um, thinking about really whether in Africa these impacts are felt the most, and reminding us that uh, much of this is being felt in the United States also, so we are all in this together, regardless of what assumptions you hold true, that there is a motivation to act and it's important to act now, but even in acting now, some of the impacts of the action that we need to take now might be delayed. Um, a good reminder on, on looking at, at what are some of the main drivers of migration and to think about whether climate is a main driver or not, and taking this to the security realm and presenting the case that scarcity can be a reason for cooperation and bringing in the questions of, of governance. So um, very interesting, a number of issues to, to build on and, and talk about. So I wanted to, to ask uh, both of you a few questions and then open it up for the floor to a broader discussion. And, and, and I wondered, um, for both of you, we've recently had the IPCC fifth assessment report, and it seems that in that report, there's a greater recognition of these connections. Um, so I, I, I wondered whether you had any thoughts about we see some of these connections being discussed in a report coming out from the IPCC. What are your, your reactions to that? Is this something that is, is it really new? Is it new information that's being, or is it information that's being repackaged and tailored to a different audience? The fact that the IPCC is recognizing it, does it give it a, a certain weight that we may not have had before? I know Marcel, you and I have talked about the African perspective and a lot going on in terms of climate change research in Africa, but yet it's not being coordinated in a regional way and pre being presented to African decision makers in a way that they can use it. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the IPCC reports and sort of, you know, how do we get this information into the hands of policymakers? Susanna, would you like to start? Okay. Um, well, the... Um, there? Okay. Uh, the report on Group 2 just came on April, so it took a while uh, to finally uh, be published. I mean, it's not the final report, actually, it's the final draft right. agreed upon, and there's a still discussion going on. One of the things that um, was evident from the beginning, especially if you look at the draft, is the number of topics that are addressed now, specifically at different chapters, is so much larger. For example, rural and urban areas are separate, and now there is a specific to, uh, chapter on livelihoods, that the one that I started to, to look. There's nothing specific on population, but because this is just a cross-sectional topic that um, I was looking specifically for reference to migration, there are more reference to migration. But my, this is my very personal opinion. When I started reading some of the uh, um, uh, report about um, rural areas and then on livelihoods. My impression is that there is no actually new new science there. It's, it's just putting together what has been written upon in the last 10 years. Uh, and that sense, I think that is very important because the IPCC report has authority on the field. So it's something that it, it is in the IPCC report, it's something that at least is going to be looked upon and is going to be considered. And because it's linked to uh, this way of Mm, how they call it, very likely, less likely, medium likelihood, so on. So I think it's important the IPCC is looking into what is a, a, um, adaptation and mitigation in a different way. There is more connection between mitigation and adaptation, although there is not perfect yet. Um, the new models about the shared socioeconomic password are not in the IPCC report. There was no time for including them, but that's another way that the future research could address that. Um, and I think that because in the IPCC report it's something that policymakers are more likely to take into consideration, also because there is a report that's specifically for policymakers mm -hmm. that include all these different things. The division in region is more accurate now. I, can talk, I cannot talk specifically about Africa, but for Latin America now, South America and Central America are separated. And that's just logic because they're 
it's quite different in a number of issues, particularly in terms of exposure and vulnerability to, to climate change and in terms of mitigation and, and adaptation. Okay, great. Foster? Well, I think the, in, in the last uh, 10 years, as Susanna says, a lot more research has been done. So we now know, you know, the, the, the amount of knowledge is growing exponentially. Uh, we now know much more uh, than we did when the previous IPCC report was circulated, which of course doesn't mean that we know everything. I think the more you know, the more you realize that what you don't know may even be more important than what you do know. Uh, you know, part of my philosophy on not believing things is that uh, I don't think there is one area of human endeavor where we understand more than 20% of reality. And I think that also goes for the life sciences. It may be difficult to argue that with your surgeon if he uh, proposes a specific course of action, although I have done so and I would say with success. I, I was in a wheelchair two years ago and on two occasions was due to be operated and both cases refused. And, uh, you know. Still here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I, uh, I would say that my judgment was in the end better than the uh, opinion he based on the 20% of reality of my back, which he understood. Um, anyway, so I, I as, as Roger Mark was saying, the major problem really is, is policy and convincing policymakers to take account of this in a broad enough framework so you don't, you know, pursue one particular line, but as I was saying before, uh, uh, sustainable development, uh, emphasizing renewable energy is somewhere we're going to have to end anyway, so we might as well do it now. Uh, and, and, you know, gain a few years in terms of, of adaptation. Uh, but policymakers are not always easy to convince, in particular if their uh, publics are not overly sophisticated. Um, you know, I, I will refrain from commenting on the U.S. Um, or Fox News. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in Europe, certainly, uh, uh, public opinion has become a driver uh, People want their governments to take action against global warming, to reduce CO2 output, etc. And I think that that can happen in other parts of the world. But if you're dealing with a public that has very low levels of education, uh, such as in most of Africa, and, and where the concerns of policymakers are to hang on to power rather than, uh, you know, uh, plan uh, for a, a long-term future, then this becomes quite difficult. And, and I think you have to reach the policymakers. You also have to reach public opinion, uh, even if you think it's not overly sophisticated, because I think people do understand. Uh, and, and they can, the, the, even the subsistence farmers, and perhaps even particularly the subsistence farmers, can understand what's happening to them. And if there are changes on the way, uh, and the changes can, you know, I was saying, well, the, in many areas there's more rainfall than there used to be. But if the rains do not fall in the particular pattern that the agricultural system is geared to, then it is still difficult to deal with them because you may not have enough rain during the long planting season. Uh, you may have rain during periods of the year that used to be dry, which prevent you from taking in your grain harvest uh, without damage. So, you know, th I think people, uh, the, the farmers on the ground do understand that. And, and it's a question of bringing the message to, to policymakers to take account of, of these concerns. Thank you. I, um, Suzanne, I wondered whether as a, a hardcore demographer, as you describe yourself, could you talk a little bit about the role of social science and social scientists in looking at these issues? Um, yes, um, I think that um, one of the, the changes that have been in the last 10 years has been this advocacy for interdisciplinary in everything that is related to climate change adaptation and mitigation. And interdisciplinary, not like, okay, we do our part and someone else is going to do the other part and then just put it together, because that doesn't work. I mean, this, the problem has to be addressed in an interdisciplinary manner from the beginning. And I think that now, in terms of the social sciences, there is 
more interdisciplinary in term interdisciplinarity work, and also an interest from the bodies like the International Social Science Council in putting environment and climate change within the, the agenda of social scientists. And that's evident in the last report for the ISSC that is specifically about social sciences and environment. And advocating not only for the role of social scientists in the study of climate change adaptation and impacts, but also in terms of the, um, I forgot what I wanted to say, in terms of um, the importance of the knowledge that is already there. When I said that there is, for me, there's nothing specifically new about the new report, there is a huge body of knowledge in the social sciences that is still not being used. Uh, in terms of the, what I know that is demography. Migration has been studied for maybe, you know, 100 years uh, in terms of scientific study of migration. There's a huge body of knowledge about that. Migration in Africa has been studied for a long time. Some of the, the studies that were done in the 80s, in the 70s, when there was the huge drug and are there. And so th that is knowledge that is already there and can be used as input for the model, for example. There is the new methodology talking about Asian-based model in terms of predicting behavior in the future and in relation to climate change could take advantage of the studies that were done in Africa in the 70s and the 80s by Sadie Firley, by Mese Hausken. So there is there, 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 there has been there for Ezra, uh, Marcos, er, Marcos Ezra in Th Ethiopia, uh, starting with multi-level uh, longitudinal uh, models. So that is there. Nothing, nothing prevented for going and say, okay, this is the, really there, how we can use this. But also that's part of the role of the, of the scientist. Mm -hmm. to recover that, to start, start using that old knowledge in, in the, not old knowledge, previous research in the new research and advance from there. Some sort of building on that. Building, exactly. Okay. Building, on, not reinventing the wheel in every step. So Marcel, I, I, I know Susanna talked a little bit earlier about the um, Latin American perspective and sort of the division of the IPCC reports, South America having this distinction from Central America. In, in your role as a former advisor to the European Union and being sort of a key person in, in European Union deliberations, I wonder if you could offer a little bit of a European perspective. How is the European community looking at these connections? Is it gaining traction? What do you see as the policy opportunities from a European perspective? I think uh, in Europe, luckily, the, the policymakers do take account of public opinion, and, and public opinion is the main driver of migration policy because uh, technically uh, the EU uh, does not have uh, full legal competence over migration issues. This is viewed as home affairs, which is dealt largely uh, with largely by member states and not jointly. It's only uh, in the last few years that a uh, very modest uh, attempt has been made to address some issues together, and migration, of course, is one of them. But uh, I think people in, in Europe uh, watching television and watching what's happening on the street, first of all, they see more sub-Saharan Africans walking on the street, and then the question is, is this good development? Is this something that, that we should encourage? Should we try and stop this? Uh, how, how should we respond? Uh, in, in Italy, for example, where there are many uh, refugees arriving on the shores, uh, you find uh, in the last year or two, uh, uh, particularly men selling uh, trinkets on the street in every city, and, and you know not just a few like you know, down down the beach. Uh, so, you know, people would ask, I mean, is, is this a good development? And apparently it is because they don't have legal papers and they're not allowed to accept regular work, so they, they have to, to find a way of, of getting by. Uh, the other uh, aspect that motivates public opinion, of course, is what they see on TV. What they see on TV is, is bodies. Uh, floating up on the beach in, in, in southern Spain and, and uh, shipwrecks in which hundreds of people drown, you know, the Lampedusa uh, affair a few months ago, and, and currently there are more flows going to Greece. Uh, again, a lot are going toward Italy because the, 
the weather in the Mediterranean area has been quite good in the last few weeks, uh, you know, with little wave action so that uh, 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 very ramshackle uh, vessels uh, could uh, try and, and, and make the crossing. And Europe is trying to develop a, a common approach to this, and there's an initiative called Eurosur, uh, which basically uh, tries to combine intelligence from various national sources, because, you know, as I said, 95% of this is done at the national level rather than jointly by EU agencies. But uh, the EU facilitates the exchange of information so that uh, people will know which vessels have been spotted and they work with uh, uh, ships, uh, commercial uh, vessels, uh, which uh, uh, observe uh, ships that they come across, even if they're not in distress, and relay this information to, to uh, uh, naval authorities so that they will have an idea of, of what is happening. But the, the general approach has been one of trying to avoid more disasters. And of course, trying to avoid more disasters means that you go to the aid of a vessel as soon as it is within your territorial waters and you take the people on board, and then you land them, and once you land them, they've achieved what they wanted, which is they've, they've become uh, immigrants, technically, and they can go through the, 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 the process. And uh, you know, people in the EU will say, well, it's not so big uh, a problem at this stage. I think the number last year was 230,000 uh, illegal immigrants who had arrived by sea. Uh, and of course, on a total population of whatever, 500 or 600 million in the EU, this is not so much. They, they can be absorbed. Question is whether this is what you want to encourage, uh, because of course the word will get out that you know, uh, there, there are efforts on the way to, to get you safely ashore. Um, so they're now considering other alternatives, such as doing the initial uh, processing of uh, refugees on ships so that they would not have to be landed on shore and they could more easily be returned uh, to Libya or wherever they're coming from. But of course, this then requires the approval of the Libyan authorities or the, uh, you know, the authorities of the countries of origin. So it's not so, so simple, but uh, so, you know, as I said, uh, the home affairs is, is something that is still in the making. In a way, the, the European Union as a whole has been, uh, you know, a work of slowly building up institutions. And, and uh, I had the, the, the good fortune of being in on the implementation of the Treaty of Maastricht. Uh, uh, very early on from the mid-90s when foreign policy was just being designed and the foreign policy instruments for the EU were being designed. Uh, but uh, expanding it to migration is uh, an, an, an ongoing uh, task that will require uh, uh, more cooperation and, and, and setting up uh, institutions to, to implement uh, a common approach. Yes, I have one last question for Susanna, and then we'll open it up. So, Susanna, you talked more broadly about different demographic components, and you talked about fertility. I wonder if you, or you mentioned fertility. I wonder if you could talk about reproductive health programming and perhaps how you see these issues fitting in with concerns about reproductive health, women's empowerment, family planning. Do you see any connections there? Do you see any opportunities there? In relation to in relation to environmental impacts, climate change? Hmm. Um, I consider two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that reproductive health and reproductive rights has a, a space on, on by themselves and don't need to be connected to climate change in order to be relevant. I mean, their rights and, I mean, I, I, I have the position of Al Qaeda 94, so I think that that that's important, Doesn't, that they don't need to be connected to climate change in order to be important. Now, there has been some studies, and there's not a lot of studies that relate climate change with fertility per se, more about governance and through governance empowerment. And that has to do with 
the position of women within different societies and within specifically if they are in power or not in order to take care of themselves and take care of their families. So those are the studies that I have seen that has to do with adaptations to governance and the role of women and particularly the position of women within the societies. Empowerment has been for a long time connected to the effective use of reproductive rights because you can have a bill of rights and not have the opportunity of, of having the right. So, but that's so far as my, the connection I can do. There's not an enough studies, I have to say, about environment and fertility. Most of the studies are about environment and mortality because of health and migration and environment that is increasing. Fertility and environment in terms of climate change is something that is just starting now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last uh, Population Association of American uh, um, uh, conference that was in Boston um, two weeks ago, uh, there was one session organized by Lori Hunter about effective eff uh, fertility and climate change. And uh, Lori has been working on this for a long time in the Ang Angincourt studies in South Africa. But there's still a lot to do on that particular. The connection is not that obvious that you want. So there's some more reliable. And you need to go through the complexity of the relationship between society and environment in order to get to that. Great. Well, thank you for sort of highlighting the Cairo agenda and sort of the rights perspective. So let's let's open up um, let's open up the floor and um, uh, please identify yourself. My colleagues will come around with a microphone. This is being um, recorded live, it's being webcast. So please um, give your name and your affiliation, and if you can keep your your questions brief, so we have an opportunity for a discussion. So yes. Yeah, I'm Ed Berry with the Sustainable World Initiative. Um, a couple questions. One question is, why are we doing research on migration? What's the driving force? What's what's the purpose? If you were to explain to someone why we do all this research, what's what's the purpose of it? Is the first question. The second question is, this this discussion is supposed to be about critical questions and gaps in understanding that need to be addressed. And it seems to us that one of the critical questions that's no longer being addressed is what is the capacity of an ecological system or an environmental resource system to support human life at a reasonable quality? Our, it, that doesn't seem to be studied anymore. We don't talk about population numbers ever since Cairo. We're only talking about demographic refinements, various issues about demography, but we don't seem to focus on what numbers can be supported by the land. And I'm, so I'm wondering if you'd have a comment also about the, the old uh, phrase, carrying capacity, and how this relates to your work. Thanks. Okay, and we have another question here. Yes, uh, Charles Teller from uh, George Washington University, and I've also been teaching at Addis Ababa University for 25 years. Um, I want to uh, I, I want to just say that it, yeah, I think it's important uh, that a lot of these issues are often local. It's you can show maps of the world, you can show maps of the Horn of Africa. You can show maps of Ethiopia, but as you could see, a lot of it is local. Yeah, the, the Somali, the Agadan is so different from the, from the Northwest. So I think that in our discussions, and even on carrying capacity, a lot of this is, is local. I would like to ask the two uh, speakers to though, focus on what I feel is critical in these more, in the developing countries with that have had rapid population growth where now fertility is declining, and that is a focus on youth. Youth is where most of the migration happens. The highest rates of migration are with youth, and also with uh, increased population uh, uh, density uh, uh, and uh, the uh, educational transition, uh, there's increasing uh, there's increasing problem of a youth bulge uh, in these countries and the lack of land and of jobs uh, to to meet those. So 
I would think that in the transition and trying to tie in migration with uh, the environment and urbanization, you would consider the, pro the issue of uh, youth. And uh, related to that is, uh, you know, Paul Collier's book on um, it's Exodus, and I would like to hear the uh, Marcel's uh, take on that. Paul is basically saying, he's the author of The Bottom Billion, that uh, migration may be good for the receiving countries, but overall it's bad for the sending countries with some, with some um, uh, exceptions. So let, uh, let me just f f uh, say that in our research with case studies, including uh, Marco Cesar's studies and others, uh, we find that the situation of youth depends a lot uh, on, again, where they're living and where they're, what their expectations are. But the role of girls and their, their desire to delay marriage and get better education is not necessarily environmentally driven. That's really a uh, generational um, uh, a change. But in other areas, like in the Southwest, uh, where there's, there has been uh, climate variability and population pressure, then a lot of it, a lot of the environmental migration is not permanent, but it's seasonal and circular. And Susanna, we often don't measure the circular and impermanent migration. That's one of the big uh, data gaps. Yeah, thanks very much, Charles. So we have uh, a few questions on the table. Why, why study migration? What about carrying capacity? And uh, what about youth? How do youth fit in? So uh, Marcel, can we start with you? Well, I think uh, certainly from a European perspective, uh, it's worth studying migration. In fact, the, the European Commission is making migration as one of the priorities of its current research program because it wants to understand the drivers and, and it wants to uh, foresee how the EU will be affected by migration flows, not saying that they will achieve what they are setting out to do or that they will see clearly through what's going to happen. But uh, you know, my assumption would be that it's relatively easy to predict what will happen. You don't necessarily understand why, but uh, migration pressures will continue. And they will continue in part, and 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 you know, someone mentioned uh, uh, Paul Collier and and migration being bad for uh, the country of origin. Uh, certainly, uh, the Ethiopian government is blowing hot and cold at the same time. On the one hand, they are trying to limit migration toward the Middle East because it has led to so many problems, uh, personal problems, bilateral problems with the governments of those countries, so they would sooner close that avenue. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, it's they see benefits to migration. Almost 10% of uh, Ethiopia's G GDP comes from remittances. Uh, that's hard to replace. Uh, employment uh, grows very slowly. They need 3 million new jobs a year in order to incorporate the uh, people who reach whatever age of 18 or 19. Uh, and those jobs are simply not being created. Uh, employment in 2013, employment in industry has declined in spite of all these uh, trade possibilities that have been opened toward the, the EU and the US in particular. Um, so, you know, there, there are really very few avenues available uh, that would be alternatives to migration. And I think politically, the government also sees in Ethiopia, and I think in other countries as well, often sees uh, migration as a kind of safety valve. If you really feel that you know, you're getting a rotten deal here, just go. You know, and uh, then you, 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 know, you will face some risks and you will face problems, and if you're successful, you will send some back, back some money. So you know, we'll, we will win. Uh, in, 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 in any way. Uh, there, this may be a relatively minor thing, but I think that in the minds of some Ethiopian leaders, population is a weapon. Um, it's a weapon in the sense that if Ethiopia has a substantially higher population than Egypt, then the Egyptians will no longer uh, 
be able to bellyache about Nile waters. I mean, from their perspective. I mean, Egypt has a legitimate claim to Nile waters, of course, and has no alternative. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in their quest to use Nile waters for power generation, irrigation, etc., cetera, uh, population is a powerful argument. Um, I'm not sure whether I, uh, you know, uh, one more comment on, on youth. Um, you know, I, I spoke uh, briefly about uh, climate change and conflict. Um, of course, population and conflict uh, is very heavily centered on the youth component. And to have a large, unemployed, urban youth population, in particular among relatively educated youth, this creates a wave of discontent uh, that may be the trigger uh, for, for serious political upheavals. Yeah. Okay. Um, very interesting question, why to study migration? Uh, why continue studying migration? And I think that's something that Marcel said uh, is important to consider. There is this idea that migration only refers to international migration. And international migration, even when um, in terms of demographic process, can be studied as just a continuum of migration, has very specific political uh, 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 consideration. And, and I think that some of the, the, the things that Marcel mentioned, the drivers, the remittances, are specific of international migration and, and are contentious. So you have the interest of the country of origin, the uh, interest of the country of destination, and that's always going to create a, a risk uh, among those. Now, um, from the point of view of the demogra of demography, migration is one of the three basic population processes that explains the dynamic of population growth, decline, and distribution. So that, that's why the basi very basic migration, I mean, demography 101. Also because migration has profound implication in terms of the individual's course of life, in terms of the biography of the individual, in terms of the composition of the families, in terms of the health of the community. So migration could be considered from many different point of view, and that's why I think it's, it's still a topic of a study. Could be a study from the point of view of social psychology, um, from individual psychology, from the point of view of geography, has many different dimensions. Uh, another question, so it could be f also a matter of choice, if you are interested or not on, on that particular issue, if you consider that it's something that has to be a study, uh, being a f from a different region is actually something that has merit to be a study or not. Uh, another question that I think is very interesting is uh, in terms of a carrying capacity. I don't use that term. Uh, I do not use carrying capacity. Uh, um, I, I want those that do not use carrying capacity because even if you can talk about carrying capacity at the global level, about this idea of finite resources, when you go to local, and I think that something you said is essential to talk about the local and differential between region, then you don't, you have a lot more complicated assessment. What exactly is the carrying capacity of an area that could be New York City where half of the food is coming from who knows where. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the global processes that include increasing mobility also include the global market and make it be a lot more difficult to talk about the carrying capacity of a specific area in terms of the population that could be sustained. Now, I think that it's very interesting to study and to research the links between the carrying capacity and the ecological footprint where the population and the consumption is not linked to the area where the population is located, but to the whole area where the resources for that population are coming. I think that a study carrying capacity in conjunction with a footprint, ecological footprint could be a more promising, promising area. And there's more studies about foot, ecological footprint now um, and tracking where resources are coming. Uh, the case of the water in the southeast of the United States, that is becoming critical because of the predicted uh, impact of climate change in cities that are already low in, in resources and carrying the water <coughs> in different areas. So, I think, I think that it could be very interesting to start, start, to start 
researching these two concepts in conjunction and see how they affect each other in terms of the local population uh, that are producing for population that are far away, or, for example, what are the effects of the uh, land grabbing in Africa in terms of the carrying capacity? So I think that there is a lot to explore in that question that uh, you, you put together. Uh, numbers. I think that numbers are part of the picture, but you cannot refer only to the numbers. Numbers change very quickly, and I think that as, as drivers of migration are the, one of the reasons why you study migration, what is driving the changes in population and the numbers are also interesting. Again, numbers at the global scale are one, at the local scale could be something different. And I think that focusing only on numbers is problematic. And the, the, the why I'm, I mean, you mentioned that it's all 94 and right. I think that was, that was a very important change in terms of demography and population policies. And I think that it's important to remember that. And because that, before El Cairo 94, it was Mexico. And that was, that, that's the comparison that we need to do. Exactly how reproductive rights and reproductive health and not only contraception. Has got other questions, comments, thoughts? We have one here and one at the back. Paul Cook, State Department Office of Global Food Security. Uh, we're interested uh, in the question of how climate change will affect agricultural productivity, and one dimension of that is uh, the availability of a labor force. Uh, I don't have a connection with the primary sources on this, but one worry is that uh, a migration of the labor force from rural to urban areas will leave uh, the, the land less, uh, the rural areas less productive in terms of agricultural production at a time when production has to increase and at a time when climate change is, is affecting uh, the capacity to produce. So I'd appreciate your, your perspective on the significance of that concern and, and the data uh, behind it. Thank you. Question at the back. Senator so Hafezayan, uh, Start Secretariat. The, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the panel for the presentation. The fifth assessment report, particularly the chapter on, on human security, does underscore the fact that this conflict, migration, or broadly stated human security, climate change nexus is understudied. Uh, if, if, if we were to be more specific and identify critical uh, knowledge gaps there, particularly in the African context, what would be the themes that you would recommend uh, merit deeper uh, investigation? Thank you. Okay, good, thank you. So um, what are some of the connections between labor force, food security, and production, and um, critical knowledge gap with regard to security and climate change? Would you like to start? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to defer to Marcel about the, the human security question. I have not read the specific chapter on human security, and I think that he has a lot more tools to answer that. In terms of agricultural productivity, I think it's a very interesting question, and I, I, I don't know um, how to address the issue. Uh, one of the changes in terms of agricultural system is the increase in capital inputs in terms of technology and machinery, and less and less uh, labor force. So in that case, the good is critical is that the labor force has not the knowledge necessary for in order to have this different kind of productivity. Uh, the other issue could be that certain kind of crowd do require very uh, specific uh, labor force, particularly vegetables. Uh, so I think that depends on the, the kind of crop that you're talking about. It, it is a very extensive crops. 
uh, is more about the capacity, the skills of the of the labor force that remains in, in place. And in the other case is uh, in what, how many people you have. However, something that uh, um, Charles said, there is a lot of circular migration that is related to the needs of the, of the uh, agricultural system during uh, the high season for labor force. So that could be one of the ways of making up for the lack of permanent residence in the area. Another trend, and this is for South for Latin America, I'm not aware of the rest of the, of the world, is that more and more the labor force working in agriculture are residing in urban areas. I'm not talking about the large urban areas, but medium-sized urban areas and just traveling to the field when it's necessary. Uh, however, I think that is a very interesting question to pose in terms of future scenarios as uh, migration from rural areas continue and that could, could have a stress. I remember uh, one particular paper that was dealing with um, community systems in, in Asia, in Asia it was, and the fact that the migration uh, was putting a stress in this community um, health system because there was not enough human resources to keep this community system going. But it's just the only reference I have, it was a local study. Okay, on migration and, and land use and food security. Um, this is a real issue, although, of course, I would say in Ethiopia there is very little possibility of running out of labor. Um, it's a question of, uh, to some extent, uh, where is the work and uh, who are the people who can do it or who would be prepared to do it? And I'm thinking, for example, of the very ambitious plans that the Ethiopian government has for the Omer, Omer River Valley, uh, which would be irrigated as a result of the construction of four major dams uh, on the Omer River, which ends in Lake Turkana. Uh, will probably contribute to lowering uh, the levels uh, in Lake Turkana, but nevertheless, um, uh, so this water would be used for power uh, generation and for irrigating large areas. Now, this area is inhabited essentially by uh, subsistence farmers and pastoralists. The pastoralists are very unlikely to provide good cannon fodder for the sugar plantations. So the plans and, you know, all of these things are rumors because documents are not being circulated, but the, the plans apparently are uh, for 800,000 jobs to be create, created in the Omer River. And you would think, wow, this is going to give jobs to all the people who live there, except that it's very unlikely that these people will want to do it uh, because this is not part of their mentality. So the... Uh, uh, assumption seems to be that these people will be imported from uh, drought-prone areas in the north and the northeast, Amhara, Tigray, uh, and uh, you know. So I, I leave it to to whatever imagination to uh, think of what problems this may create. So and of course this. Uh, shift is a result of the government allocation or allocation by the government of very large tracts of land to some domestic and some foreign companies that will produce the, the sugar and then, or that, that will produce the sugar cane, and then uh, again factories by domestic and foreign investors that will uh, process the sugar. Um, so, uh, but of course, in order to, to achieve that, you will need to displace pastoralists and subsistence farmers. Uh, first of all, will they like that? Second, um, is this going to add to uh, food security? Because a lot of the production of these uh, uh, new enterprises will be exported. And, and, you know, a large part of the motivation of the development of the Omer River is to export electricity to Kenya. Uh, 
and at the same time to produce sugar in excess of domestic needs, which can then be exported. Um, climate change and, and, and migration um, and security, security. yeah. Um, I think the evidence is rather conflicting and, and you know, I, I think it's difficult to, to blame the IPCC for saying that this is an issue that requires further investigation. Um, you can look at uh, studies that have been done uh, for other periods and other parts of the world. If you look at uh, the Middle Ice Age of the first half of the 17th century, this was a serious disruption in climate affecting food production capacity in the entire northern hemisphere. Good studies have been done for Western Europe and for China, two international systems that operated essentially independently from each other. In both, there have been sharp increases in conflicts. This could be a coincidence, because in Europe this coincided with the religious wars and you know, all sorts of other issues which were of a political nature. Nevertheless, it would be a serious hint at you know, climate change having been involved with conflict. And uh, some people have made studies for Africa uh, about rising temperatures, etc., and have predicted that like, even a one degree rise in average temperature of one degree Celsius uh, will have a sizable impact on the incidence of conflict. But, you know, as I say, I think the, the, the evidence is, is conflicting, is not fully convincing, and I would uh, still argue that, that governance uh, is important. It, obviously, if you're dealing with a failed state uh, that cannot control its population, that cannot allocate resources, uh, that cannot guarantee access to resources, uh, the likelihood of conflict is greater. Uh, so governance, I think, is, is still more important, although, of course, we need to keep an eye on, on uh, the, the, the link with climate change. Okay, final round of questions. Any additional questions to round us off? Yes, please, at the back. Thank you. Um, my name is Matthew Edwardson. I work with the Tetra Tech. Uh, I was curious on how, in your in your, I guess, thinking from the policy outreach that your demography and climate change work is doing, in, in terms of um, infrastructure development in a lot of these, uh, particular in, in these in a lot of African cities, and and you, you're talking about a large migrations. We talked about youth earlier, but what you know, what will be done in terms of just development of, you know, the electrical grid, the power you know, um, grid, et cetera, the, you know, water, you know, transportation. And, you know, I think, you know, some, some would say, I heard discussion earlier that, you know, there may or may not be attribution to, you know, variability in the Sahelian climate, increasing migration towards the coast or not. But the fact of the matter is, is a lot of people are moving in that direction. And the the actual cities don't necessarily have the capacity to absorb those populations and provide them with services. What role does demography and its predictive power or the ability of it to, to model forward um, play in, in terms of informing policymakers to help make decisions on investments, et cetera? Okay, thank you. Any other final questions? Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Karen Newman from London, so I think I'm very lucky to be here. Uh, I, I just wanted to comment on something that, um, first of all, that Susanna said about Cairo. I think it's really important for us to remember that uh, demography has been uh, largely absent from the sexual and reproductive health and rights discourse as a result of Cairo. And I think it's really important that as it comes back, we must remember what we learnt in Cairo, that everything must be done in a way that respects and protects human rights. Uh, I think that's really important that as we begin to talk about demography, it's, that's the lens that we bring to it. I also want to respond to something Marcel said about mi migration, because I loved 
the way that he talked about a very measured response in Europe to concern about disaster and managing it from a European perspective. But some of the press in some European countries is really vicious and racist. I mean, from where I sit in London, the anti-immigration, the things that are being said are truly grotesque. UKIP is going to do very well in the European elections. It's nominally anti-EU. It actually isn't. It's a very uh, racist uh, setup there. And so for me, the importance of migration is to give people the tools and the evidence they need that they need to say exactly what you said. The numbers we're talking about are very, very small. And we need to understand that more deeply. And I really hope that some of the research that is ongoing can help us with those kinds of messages, because I think the coming politics around migration is going to become more and more complex. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Good to see you and welcome. So we have um, two, two issues that we've put out there, or three issues, looking at infrastructure development and demography and its predictive power. Um, so if any of there are any comments on that, just sort of this reminder of looking again at the Cairo agenda and the rights perspective that has, has emerged coming out of Cairo, but not forgetting what we learned leading up to Cairo and what it means to the positioning of demography in a rights uh, context, and then recognizing the um, complexity of immigration and messaging on immigration and, and the importance of continuing that research so that we can inform messages that are generally um, shared with the, the public around very sensitive issues to make sure. I, I think this is a little bit, um, Susanna, what you were talking about, about your cafe conversations. This is how do we avoid these uh, chatless there, the cafe around these issues that we really is um, have an opportunity to have evidence informed, to have meaningful policy relevant um, discussions around these issues. So I'd like to open it up. Uh, uh, Marcel, you could start, and then Susanna, you could end, and any concluding remarks you'd like to make also. Okay, thank you. Um, infrastructure. I think uh, certainly uh, Brazil, for example, has been an indication that uh, road construction leads to migration. Uh, people uh, form new centers. Uh, in Africa, the same thing has happened. When railways were built 100 years ago, new cities formed around railway terminals. Addis Ababa was, to a large extent, the product of the railway that the French built uh, that was completed in 1917. Uh, the halfway point between Djibouti and Addis Ababa was Dirdawa, about equidistant from each of the ends, and which became a city merely by virtue of having been the terminal of the first half of the, of the construction. Uh, and the same thing will apply for roads. Uh, uh, infrastructure is one of the few areas on which uh, European governments and African governments agree, you know, that the uh, EU is a major, I would say the biggest, but I'm not going to, we are not going to get into analyzing figures because if you choose the, the joint uh, 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 development funds made available by, by the European Union, they are less than what's being made available by the US, but if you add funds being made available bilaterally, by Germany, UK, France, Italy, to those being made available jointly through EU institutions, then the EU is substantially larger. And infrastructure work is uh, an issue on which uh, the European and the African side agree very easily because the Europeans can build in some sort of safeguard so that part of the work goes to European contractors and hence some of the money flows back into the coffers of, of uh, European states and the Africans like infrastructure work uh, because uh, you know these are projects that they cannot otherwise afford and they uh, inevitably bring with them lowering of transportation costs and, and uh, some, some degree of, of economic growth. Uh, so you know the demographic impact, yes, uh, on migration, uh, certainly on, on, on fertility, I'm not quite sure. To the extent that people move in cities, maybe their fer fertility will be lower, as has usually been the, the result of, of urbanization. Um, uh, 
response to migration in Europe, um, in every country there's a kind of current of thought uh, that is racist. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's true. Uh, and in every country there is a political party that caters to that and that seeks to increase its representation by uh, either using overt or more subtle racist messages. Um, I think this is a, a result of democracy which we may not like but which we have to accept and, and therefore obviously it is uh, uh, an element which flows into the policy making uh, where the government has to uh, moderate uh, immigration numbers in order to keep down the criticism that comes from that corner. Uh, but, you know, that's the reality, yeah. Um, in terms of infrastructure development, um, I think there's two sides. That they, what Marcel was talking about is when you have infrastructure, and particularly roads, that's, that's very true. And assuming that the roads are going to an area that is desirable, then there's going to be people, population following that. Um, so you had the effect on migration, and depending what kind of area is developing, you can have a frontier effect in terms of the uh, fertility effect. But usually it's just it's one generation. At least in the case of Brazil, the first generation had a fer a fertility increase, the second generation declined, the third generation le left the area. So that's some of the histor histories on, in the case of Brazil. In terms of the how, how to project this, if, if, population, if demography could work with this, that depends on the size. In general, population projection was for small areas are very un unaccurate and inaccurate. Uh, th there is too many factors at play in order to have accurate projections. So you can have um, input in order to know how the different processes interact together and still don't have an accurate uh, projection. Um, it could be short projection, could be more reliable, but still uh, local projection and small area projection are problematic. Uh, in, at least so far. I think that there are more modern um, uh, effort that could have a better result. But infrastructure is uh, something that could be a driver or could also be an effect because the infrastructure could be built a posteriori of the case and that's what happened in many urban areas where you have an influx of population and a posteriori of that you have the infrastructure built, particularly services. So there's double source over there. Um, then on the right perspective, um, I don't really understand what you said that demography was out of the picture after Al Qaeda didn't have a lot to do. Uh, but that could be just a personal uh, the consequence of my background. I, study, I started to study demography in Latin America. So for, uh, for, for when I was studying, was when Al Qaeda 94 happened when I was studying in Mexico, in Flaxo. So at that point, there was this uh, idea from Latin American demography in population and development, and how El Cairo was a refreshing uh, effort after what happened in, in Mexico. So does it that how demography relied to rights and how demography re demographers relied to rights and the different population and development conference that happened after that uh, I think it depends, it has a little of a regional aspect at some point. And also professional. Uh, I always work in academia, so it also gives me a completely different perspective from uh, demographers that are working on policy. Uh, I think that, that those are, at this point, different uh, areas of expertise. Although there is a lot of, of uh, interaction between them, and more and more. Particularly, applied demography is increasing the role in the in the field. 
Great, thank you. So three quick uh, in conclusion to me. Um, you know, I think with our discussion today, first the importance once again of questioning our assumptions, and that is a very useful and, and productive enterprise in terms of building the evidence base. The second, continuing the importance of, of research and the looking at the role of social scientists and social science when we address these, these issues um, and, and how that continues to, to build the evidence base to inform policy. And third, the questions and discussion that we had around the validation of research that can inform policy and ways that we continue to think that we bring on academics with those who are, are providing research that's um, in the context of policy application. So I think a very rich and engaging discussion today. So please join me in thanking both Marcel and Susanna. So they'll be around for a few more minutes if anyone would like to um, continue the discussion um, on a one-to-one -one basis. Thank you.